right, hello everyone. Welcome to our virtual event space. So my name is Allie, I'm your host for this evening and I am so excited to be introducing Kendara Blake and Martha Brokenbro here to discuss Kendara's new book, All These Bodies. Uh, but before we get into the good stuff, I just wanna quickly thank you all so much for tuning in. As much as we miss having everyone in the bookstore, it has been such a delight to expand this program online to connect readers and virtual, or to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank you all so much for tuning in and buying books. Your support is what makes all of this possible. So there are signed book plates available for all of these bodies. Um, so if you'd like a signed book plate, go ahead and order a copy through our website. I will be linking books directly in the chat all evening, so it'll be super easy to go find them. For those of you in the Seattle area, come on in. All three of our locations are open, or you can place an order online and come pick them up in store or if you're not local we do ship and once again we're so so grateful for your support while you're over on our website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up in the next few months. And if you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases, our online book clubs. And of course, you can follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. And we have a pretty good time over on our social media. Uh, we even have a TikTok. So definitely go check those out, see if there's any Anything over there for you. So speaking of social media, if you would like to check out any of our past virtual events, we have most of them available on our YouTube channel, uh, including this event within the next 48 hours. So if you'd like to see our other virtual events or share this one, go ahead and track us down over there. Uh, so we are going to be here for about an hour and towards the end we will be taking questions so if you have any questions which we very much hope that you do go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box which should be either at the top or bottom of your screen it is different than the chat box which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other we'd love to know where you're from or your latest favorite read but when it comes time for questions, please do leave those in the Q&A so we can most easily find them. Uh, also, towards the end of this evening, we will be doing a giveaway for all of you here who are living in the US. Um, one person will be getting a copy of All These Bodies and a copy of Into the Blood Red Woods, which is Martha's new release, which is coming out in November, so we can all look forward to that. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone of our commitment to ensuring the safety and well-being of event attendees and guest authors. So in our chat and question spaces, please do lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. There are auto-generated closed captions available from the menu at the top or bottom of your screen. Select the live transcript button to enable or disable them. And finally, should any technical ar issues arise, which, you know, it could happen. This is all online, so <laughs> we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them, and we appreciate your patience and understanding. All right, and I believe that that is all of my housekeeping. So without further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce Kendara Blake, the number one New York Times bestselling author of the Three Dark Crown series, as well as Anna Dressed in Blood, a Sybil's Awards finalist, Girl of Nightmares, Anti-Goddess, Mortal Gods, and Ungodly. Her books have been translated into over 20 languages, have been featured on multiple best of the year lists and have received many regional and librarian awards. Tonight, we are here to discuss her newest book, All These Bodies, uh, in which a family is murdered and the only suspect, 15-year-old Marie, agrees to tell her story, but only to the sheriff's son, a young aspiring journalist. So in conversation this evening, I'm so pleased to welcome back Martha Brokenbro, the acclaimed author of two books for adults and 10 books for young readers, both fiction and nonfiction, including Unprecedented, The Game of Love and Death, Alexander Hamilton, Revolutionary, The Dinosaur Tooth Fairy, Divine Intervention, and Cheerful Chick. Her newest book, Into the Blood Red Woods, which comes out in November, is about a werebear princess who has to fight to reclaim her kingdom from her tyrannical brother. So 
thank you both so much for being here. I'm so excited to be a fly on the wall for this conversation. If you need anything, go ahead and give me a shout. I will be listening. Same goes for all of you in the audience. I will be in chat. And with that, I'm going to pass the stage to our authors. Welcome, both of you. Thanks, Thank you. Allie. Thank you for hosting us tonight, Allie. Um, Martha, uh, cheers. This is a, um, I call it Michael's Murdery Milkshake after the narrator of my book and he drinks milkshakes in there. So it is just ice cream, a little bit of clear liqueur, cherry on top, and there's some like grenadine syrup in the bottom, so. Perfect. This is just a glass of blood because that's what I drink. Excellent. So if mm. any of the participants at home want to skedaddle quickly into their kitchen and rustle themselves up a snack or a beverage, cocktail or mocktail, please do. And we'll all have a little bookish happy hour here. I think we should. Actually, beverages and books go so well together. Kendara, when you're writing, what's your, what's your go-to liquid sustenance? I, um, I, had, I never drank coffee my whole life. But this last year, I've started drinking coffee every day that I work. So I will make myself a huge mug of coffee with so much sugar in it that it counts as a snack. And that will be my sustenance for the entire writing day. What about you? Well, I, okay, I, I too drink coffee. I also really like seltzer, but the whole adding sugar to it, so much of the sugar trade was drove industrialization because sugar was cheap once, um, you know, once the, the uh, enslavement of human beings made it so, and they would give the factory workers in London sugar with their tea and little biscuits as a quick pick-me-up. Um, during uh, revolutionary times, the amount of sugar consumed in tea was staggering. I mean, it was something like 50 teaspoons a day. That, of course, has nothing to do with your fantastic book, All These Bodies, um, you know, except... Oh, it is. It, fascinating. It is, it's really, I mean, the world, the world is a fascinating place. Um, okay, so let me tell you, the first time I ever met Kendara, everyone, I was at another Third Place Books event, and this was, this, when did um, um, Auntie Goddess come out? 2013. 2013. So it's been quite a while now. But anyway, I went to the event and had not yet read Anna Dressed in Blood. Um, and Kendara read. Now, she's not going to read to us tonight because it just doesn't fly over Zoom. But let me tell you, let me tell you, the moment I heard her read, I just, she's an extraordinary writer. So she is a writer's writer, but she's also a storyteller's storyteller. Um, I read all these bodies. I gulped it down um, uh, shortly after I got the advanced reader copy. And from the very first page, I was absolutely hooked. Um, and so, you know, you mentioned in the intro, I don't know if that's in the um, final, the printed versions or just the arc, but you know, that it was a departure for your career. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. I know that we have some writers um, here in attendance, and I know a lot of people are curious, you know, why is this book different and what made you want to take that leap? Well, it is, and the note you're talking about is only in the arc. Um, the publisher wanted me to write something like that to just kind of warn people and warn readers about what to expect because All These Bodies is very different from my other books, um, especially Three Dark Crowns, which is what I was coming off of. So after finishing up Three Dark Crowns, I really needed a change. I needed to get away. I needed some time to switch gears from being in the island with the queens for that long. And all these bodies had actually, the idea for it had been around since before the idea for the queens, but it had not been ready. It had just been strange and unformed and annoying me. But by the time Three Dark Crowns was over, it was ready. And that's, that's what I wanted to do. So it is different in that I've never written 
a murder mystery per se. I've written about a lot of murder, but not in this kind of true crime style. I've never written anything set in the 1950s. Um, so that was new and it was just a, yeah, it was a very different kind of book for me to write. There are no sarcastic animals. There's no magic per se on the page. Um, there is a little bit of a paranormal twist in there, but for the most part, it's, it's pretty grounded. Um, uh, you mentioned that the idea wasn't quite ready yet. And so I'm always really fascinated by this because for me, it also takes, I can have an idea for something, but it takes a long time for whatever things to sprout. Um, so when you have an idea, what does it look like? Do you know right away that, oh, this could be a book or is it just what, what's happening inside your brain? Every time is different. With Three Dark Crowns, I knew immediately. Three Dark Crowns came together in a day, and I've never been so grateful to a book before. Uh, it came about because I saw a ball of bees and was fascinated by this ball about the size of my head, just 100% bees all the way through, like a basketball of bees. And I had to question a beekeeper, like, what's this about? Why are they doing that? And there was a queen bee in the middle and they move from hive to hive and that's how they protect her while they're on their way. And so then I had a bunch of questions about queen bees and learned that um, they'll lay four or five queen eggs and when the baby queens hatch out, they kill each other and whoever survives gets to take over the old hive. And I wanted to do it to people. And boom, the minute I knew, I'm like, okay, this is how it's gonna be. And the three queens, Arsenault, Katerine, Mirabella, they popped up on my car ride home and they're like, we'll do it. And I was like, yes, you will, ladies. And that was the easiest thing in the world. But all these bodies, not so. Um, it was, I wanted to write a book about, you know, teenage lovers with murder in it. Um, I was always fascinated by Charlie Starkweather and Caroline Fugate. They were real serial killers, actually spree killers, who went on an 11 victim killing spree through the Midwest in 1958. And it always fascinated me. Carol was only 14 when it happened. Charlie was 19. He was cool. He was like a James Dean stand in. And I always wondered, like, how did she get tied up in all this? So that was like the little nugget that was in my head. But it was, it was absolutely unformed and it was all strange and all weird. And then it kept showing up year after year, like, do you want to write me now? Now I have a vampire. I'm like, no, not yet, just wait. It's like, do you want to write me now? Now I want to be about Truman Capote. I'm like, okay, just hang on. And it just kept adding to itself until it finally, you know, came together, like you said. I'm wondering if you had any, like, spark moment for when you knew you wanted to write Into the Blood Red Woods. Because you know, it, it brings so many things together, so many different fairy tales, both familiar and fascinatingly obscure. <laughs> um, it's funny because the, when you were talking about how just things kept adding in different layers, so Into the Blood Red Woods many, many years ago, and so in 2009, I was at a writer's conference and there's this editor, Patty Lee Gouch, who um, is, you know, a bit of a legend. I think she edited Sarah Plain and Tall. And she's oh, wow. this really, you know, cool, no-nonsense woman who, you know, could not have been more than like four foot nine. So just a, a compact, not a ball of bees, but a ball of brilliance. <laughs> and so she gave this one writing prompt that has been incredibly useful to me ever since. She said, okay. Write about a character who is told to do the thing they least want to do in the world by someone who has absolute power over them. And so I'm like, mm, doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, I had, um, you know, been reading a lot of fairy tales. And I'm like, okay, so what if there's a girl in a castle and she's all alone and living a miserable life and she has a pet rat and then it becomes her job to exterminate all the rats in the castle. That's where I started. This book, obviously, I mean, that is not in the book, right? No, I mean, there's some rats, but it's not the same. <laughs> there are some rats. Yeah, there are versions of this book that are narrated by rats. You do have a rat reference at the very end. Um, but I started thinking about it. And I'm like, okay, stories with rats. 
because rats typically play a certain role in stories. And so, um, you know, obviously the Pied Piper is probably the most rat famous fairy tale in the world. And I read it and I thought, wait a minute, the Pied Piper is always the villain, right? You know, always like, and, and lots of retellings, the Pied Piper is like some sort of sexy musician luring people away. And I thought, okay, this is messed up because the Pied Piper, an artist came and did a job and then didn't get paid. I have had that happen to me. It doesn't feel good, right? They robbed him. And so, you know, as the story that they tell goes, the Pied Piper stole away their children. But, you know, one of the things that I've learned is that when people do lousy things, they're lousy people. Um, you know, if you steal from someone, if you refuse to pay someone who did work, you're corrupt, you're bad. And chances are they're, they're being corrupt with their children. And so I imagine what if the Pied Piper is rescuing children? And so I had that as kind of a framework for the story. Like, um, and what was interesting was that my central character, Ursula, didn't appear until later. And then she just sort of emerged like this werebear. And I loved her from the start. And so I, I reshaped the story and I decided, okay, so it's not just the Pied Piper story that's been mistold. It's the three bears. It's Hansel and Gretel. It's, um, um, you know, basically, you know, take them all. Um, Snow White with the mirror. And you can look at all these fairy tales and look at the bad people in them and imagine how, what if the story was reversed? What if they were telling their own story? And so that's kind of how it came about. And then the challenge became how to find a single narrative that could thread all these things together. And that was pretty hard. That was really impressive that you managed to have this epic, you know, war for a kingdom. And at the same time, all of the fairy tale origins and all of the fairy tales are being carried out like simultaneously. And then you just brought it home. That's but really isn't that like when, when, you know, when you're writing about three sisters vying for power. I mean, that, that's that's what fighting for kingdoms really is symbolic for, is who has power in the world and why. And so I think that's why stuff like that is, is useful. And it's, even though, you know, our books might be set in the past or in fictional worlds, there's some true stuff about what it means to be a person. And, and this is one of the things that I wanted to ask you know you've got a bunch of books out there now um eb white you know cute adorable man of the farm said you know all i want to say with my books is that i love the world what do you want to say with your books <laughs> maybe nothing so uh ambitious as loving the world um usually when i write a book i just want to tell the story I really feel like I think of myself as, as, you know, a bard or a scribe and these stories come to me from wherever they exist already and I'm just kind of pulling them down and putting them to page. So it's my job to tell them the right way and to, um, you know, to do them justice. So at the end of all that, my only hope really is that people will enjoy them. Now, sometimes thematically, there are some things that I hope that um, careful readers will come away with, uh, especially with all these bodies. There's a lot going on thematically, and I wanted to layer that in so that readers will have some, some space to scratch under the surface of what appears to be just, um, hopefully, a, a rollicking good murder mystery. <laughs> but it's, it's definitely that. Um, so, you know, you talked about telling stories in the right way. Does your work change a lot in the revision process or are you able to um, translate for the muse pretty cleanly? It depends on the book. Uh, Anna Dressed in Blood came out mostly right the first time. So did Girl of Nightmares. If I recall, it was mostly just like adding scenes in revisions and like more of it. Uh, there weren't major, major rewrites. With Three Dark Crowns, nailing the voice and telling it correctly and figuring out the right way to tell it 
took a lot more drafts. I think Three Dark Crowns went through maybe four or five total drafts, like start to finish scrapping because I hated it. Um, and all these bodies, Michael, who is my 17-year-old son of the local sheriff, aspiring journalist, well, it's, a, it's lucky for me that he actually turned out to be a pretty decent journalist, a pretty decent um, storyteller and a very easy narrator to work with. Um, true to his character, he's a very, he's just an earnest, sweet kid. I'm happy I got to spend this time with him. He's one of those guys that just wants to do a good job. He just wants to find the truth, but he's also willing to listen and learn and his mind is very open. Uh, and yeah, so his portion of the narration, which is all of it, except for what Marie tells him, Marie being the 17 or the 16 year old girl that is found drenched in blood at the scene of the crime, where previously there's been no blood found at the scene of the crime. So this is a big question mark. How'd that blood wind up on her? What is she even doing there? Is the crux of the book. It's such a dramatic opening. Should we pause and like for those people who, you know, who haven't read it yet or don't know a summary, can you just kind of tell us like the setup? Oh, sure. Yeah. The elevator pitch, if you will. So All These Bodies is the story of two teenagers who get caught up in the mystery of this brutal 1950s murder spree. It just tears through the Midwest. All of these bodies have been found just completely drained of blood, but the crime scenes are suspiciously clean. It terrorizes these small towns and nobody knows what to do until one night, Marie Catherine Hale is found with an entire family's worth of dead bodies around her. And as it happens, she will only tell her story to one young Michael Jensen, and he agrees to hear her confession while she is staying in um, his father's jail. It's such a great setup. Did you research like what it would take to exsanguinate a body? Um, I researched exsanguination. I also uh, researched like um, actual causes of vampirism, like porphyria and, and people who have um, kind of that, that mental disorder that makes them feel that they need to consume blood, um, blood disorders and that kind of thing. Uh, All These Bodies was based on three true things. It was the Starkweather Fugate murders, the murders of the Clutter family in Holcomb, Kansas that were uh, chronicled in Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, but also the vampire hysteria of New England, which I don't know if you're familiar with, mm -mm. but it was, I believe, in the time of the Puritans and also when tuberculosis was making its way across New England, and they did not understand what tuberculosis was or how it was spread, but it was running through entire families. So all they saw was someone coughing up blood, getting thinner and thinner, eventually dying, and then the same thing happening to their entire household. So of course they thought, well, that one was a vampire and now it's coming back from the grave to do the same thing to their families. So they would lead these exhumations of these tuberculosis victims and they would dig up the bodies, they would cut off their heads, they would crack open the chest, cut out the heart, burn the heart, and in some cases, if they had a family member who was ailing, they would feed the family member the ashes of the heart to try to cure them. Of course, it never worked, and it was just fear and, and a lack of medical understanding, but there were quite a few of those that occurred. Um, one of the famous ones is a girl named Mercy Brown, and um, she's mentioned in all these bodies, but there were there were exhumations as far west as Minnesota, oh, actually. Wow. So it went quite a ways, and has always fascinated me. That is, that really really is wild. Um, I, so I think your timing for this book's kind of amazing. People are totally into true crime, and this had absolutely the feel of a great true crime you know, podcasts or what I've been listening to. Um, why do you think people love it so much? True crime? I don't know. I think for the same reason that, that people love horror. It's, it's like, you know, we get to look at the dark sides of ourselves and we kind of get to judge them. We do. We watch, we watch true crime and the murders and we're like, oh, sick. And there's something very, you know, soothing and comforting about that when a murderer is caught 
And you also have the titillation factor of like, you know, walking along and in and following all of the terrible, terrible crimes that were actually committed before they were caught. Uh, we like we like that, I think, but we also like the fact that they were brought to justice. You know, we like answers. Um, we like tidy, tidy juries who. <laughs> with solid convictions so we feel like all of our questions have been answered, even though if you think about it, that's not necessarily the case. Um, like for, for example, in the case of Caroline Fugate, she was convicted as an accomplice, but she always said she was innocent. And I, in researching the trial, I discovered that it was, it was basically like a sham. Charlie Starkweather had already been convicted and sentenced to the death, sentenced to the electric chair. And he'd been quoted as saying, he would happily go to the electric chair if Carol would sit on his lap and then they let him be the star witness at her trial and his story was constantly changing and the accounts that he gave didn't make any sense forensically but what the jury heard was oh she's a bad girl oh she had sex a lot oh she's 14 but you know you you do all that stuff and and you must know what's going on there's no way she was just a traumatized kid guilty so yeah I, I just, it's, it's, you know, it's also like a chance um, to, you know, for, for people to try on another life in a safe mm -hmm. context, like what's the absolute worst that can happen. And then, you know, to vicariously live through that and uh, then, you know, get the resolution um, at the end. I, I just, I find it incredibly fascinating though, that, um, we're so eager to go to such dark places. And I know for like, for sure, Into the Blood Red Woods is, is absolutely the darkest thing that I could possibly write. I mean, it's the darkest thing that I could imagine. And yet I felt so compelled to, you know? And it's dark in a myriad of different ways. Um, it's the violence, but it's also, there's, there's a lot of oppression there's uh there's some sexual violence in there and it's but if you look at the source material you were totally true to it in a way like spiritually true because i guess well humans must have always been fascinated by that dark violent stuff because if you look at the oldest versions of fairy tales they are twisted just delightfully twisted it's not the sanitized disney stuff it was, it was dark there oh yeah i mean i i have you heard um, Malcolm Gladwell talking about The Little Mermaid on his Revisionist History podcast? No. I mean, That's I have heard of like the original, you know, more brutal versions of The Little Mermaid, but I haven't heard that. I remember actually the first time I read that version, because in the original um, Hans Christian Andersen version, The Little Mermaid does not get the prince. The prince marries someone else and like she's, she's you know, there with a knife ready to stab and then turns into foam and I was a little kid when I read that I'm like what what because it just did not feel like the stories that I had been given but then you know I read the red shoes and that of course is is a central one in into the blood red woods and and shoes are so important metaphorically I think um and you know women's feet and uh anyway the Red Shoes is a sick, sick story. A girl, she gets a pair of red shoes and is told not to put them on. And essentially it's, you know, because it's, it, and it's a metaphor for, for sex and for pleasure. And she puts them on and she can't take them off and she dances herself to death. And if you can imagine, you know, just the absolute, like what a terrible way to die. You know, your body is moving uncontrollably and, and your feet are, you know, just basically um, dancing her to death. And, and Rumpelstiltskin's also in the book. And in the end of Rumpelstiltskin, he stomps out of rage and splits the world and falls into it. And so I just got really interested in feet um, and the darkness. So, so yeah, original fairy tales, um, you know, the Brothers Grimm are aptly named. Yeah. Um, and it's it's interesting, um, the expectation that everything for young readers is sanitized. Um, and yet, 
on the other hand, we expect these kids to go walk out into a world that's full of horrors. So I don't know. I, I sometimes, sometimes we put them there. Okay. Um, <laughs> did you have a favorite character in all these bodies? I mean, I can't outside of Marie and Michael because they're like the heart and soul of, of the book. Um, all the mystery is within Marie and um, all the brain is and, and the, you know, the telling is within Michael. But hands down, it would be Percy Valentine, Michael's best friend. Um, every time he popped onto the page, he was just a surprising joy. Percy has been Michael's best friend since like sandbox times. And when I was writing it, my editor, during the first draft, she came back with a query of like, okay, so why is Michael best friends with Percy? He seems like such a doofus and Michael seems so put together. I'm like, yeah, but a lot of times that is how friendships work. Like, like the, the really straight and narrow one will be friends with the class clown. Like they complement each other. They both need each other. And Percy is the most loyal kid you will ever come across. He has a reputation around town as his dad's kind of like a junkyard guy and kind of a drunk and um, nobody takes them seriously. He's a class clown. They think he's kind of dumb, but actually Percy is very intuitive and a very sensitive individual. And I just loved him. Everybody should have a Percy. Should. And I think there's something about writing um, kind of a secondary character that gives you so much freedom. Um, I find, you know, cause maybe you find this too, but like you're the protagonist you write, they're having to carry so much weight that, you know, it can sometimes be hard to plow forward, but with these secondary characters, we can really, um, introduce some lively. Yeah. And, and comic relief. In particular, Michael is carrying so much of the decision. Um, he's, he's like a stand in for the reader almost in that he has to decide whether to believe Marie or to believe the narrative that is being constructed around Marie. And Percy is the only side character who's really only there to support him and help him out. Everybody else, all the other characters, the adult characters in the book, were there kind of to provide, provide counterpoints to, you know, different ways that Marie is being judged. The district attorney, fire and brimstone, guilty, guilty, guilty. She's a girl, she lies by nature. You know, that is, you know, the, the, his mentor at the newspaper, uh, journalistic integrity, be objective, you have to get to the truth, you know? So that's another thing that's driving him. And then his father, Sheriff Jensen, who is just a very nice, warm man who wants to give her a chance to tell her story and who even though he may not believe what she's saying, believes there is truth in it somewhere if we just let her talk um, and doesn't wanna rush to judgment. So it's like I set up all these different <laughs> models for Michael to follow and then he has to you know, interact. He's the one actually interacting with Marie and he has to decide which of these ways he's going to go. It's so smart. I also liked the, I can't remember her name now, the jailhouse secretary lady. Nancy. Nancy. I liked Nancy. She yeah. Was, she was um, so um, we talked a little bit beforehand. I, you know, I was, I was curious about, you know, your studies and whatnot. Um, did you always want to be a writer or did you perhaps have another career path charted out? I always wanted to be a writer. I just never thought it would be possible. I, I didn't want to live with my parents forever and I never thought I could write something good enough to be published. So I went to school for corporate finance. I was going to be a stock analyst. I was going to, you know, live in New York and all that stuff. Um, but I hated it. <laughs> I didn't really realize I hated it until I was a senior and they brought in a speaker who worked at like Merrill Lynch and he spent the first half of the class dazzling us with stories about his Lambo and his weekends in Aspen, and then spent like the last half of the class talking about his ulcer and his hair loss and the fact that he never got to drive the Lambo because he was always at the office. And, uh, you know, like he felt like he might be out of the game by the time he was 30. So, you know, real unappealing. And um, yeah, writing, 
I always wanted to write and it's like eventually I just decided well my parents are great people I will live with them forever I gotta give this writing thing a go and luckily I it worked out and I I don't have to live with them forever. Yay! Um, so I know you got your master's degree for um, people who are interested in developing their writing skills. What are some of the best pieces of advice you have about um, becoming a better writer? Mm. Well, since you mentioned master's degrees, um, I don't think they're necessary. I don't think they're necessary at all. I do think they're wonderful. And if you have the opportunity and the means, what a master's program will give you is complete dedicated time to be immersed in writing, to think about nothing but writing, to be surrounded by like-minded writerly minds. And usually in a good master's program, you'll have a workshopping um, kind of environment that is second to none. So will a master's program make you a better writer? Absolutely it will. It will you will be unable to keep from improving and changing. But you can do the same thing. There are so many great online communities that you can find uh, critique groups. You can listen to lectures. Uh, you can do you know a ton of different things without actually going to a program. So... Yeah, I think that's true. I teach um, at Vermont College of Fine Arts in their program, and I love it. I think it's fantastic, and I see all of the improvement. And on the other hand, it is, you know, a huge financial undertaking, um, and it is not, there's no, like, they, they don't give you a degree and then a publishing contract. You still have to do, the, you have to finish the book and revise the book and query and get an agent and, and go through all of that um, stuff. Yeah. Um, what are some books that you're reading that you would love for everybody to know about? Well, yours, obviously. <laughs> um, I, I read Into the Blood Red Woods this summer and it was fantastic. Um, for readers who liked, um, Alana Arnold's Damsel and just that kind of similarly simmering, brutal kind of under the, yeah, I just think that, you know, you should just read that one and this one together, just smush them together. And they're just like a fantastic like pairing. Um, also, oh gosh, let's see. I really enjoyed Ava Reed's The Wolf and the Woodsman, which is a fantasy. Uh, it's, oh, it's hard to describe. So I'm just going to say it's good. Check it out. <laughs> You definitely want that one. And I just finished Marissa Myers, our mutual friend Marissa Myers, Gilded, which is a Rumpelstiltskin twist. I wouldn't say it's a retelling. I'd say it's a typical Marissa spin on the whole thing. And uh, it's my new favorite Marissa book. It, oh, it, good. It has That's some good. of those similar elements that you and I are talking about, about uh, girls and the stories they're allowed to tell, girls and how they're perceived as telling the truth um, versus, you know, the things that they can say versus the things that they can't say, who determines um, the facts versus the fiction. And it has a hot Rumpelstiltskin. I didn't think that was possible, but you pulled it off. That's a really hard name to combine with hotness. <laughs> really. Well, in the name, she gives them a different she gives them a different name, which I really do think helps. Yeah, I my Rumpelstiltskin in my book is a woman, and she does not have that name. Um, it's a tough one. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I love Marissa. I think she's just an absolute genius, and uh, her stuff is so much fun. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I, what you say about girls and the stories that they're allowed to tell and how people interpret those in some ways I mean that is like some of the biggest um narrative urgency of our age is who's centered in the story and who is believed because that's who has power um and, and one of the things that I think all these bodies does in such an intriguing way um is to give a young girl who's in jail and is kind of screwed, she has power and she decides who she trusts her story to, um, 
And it's just, that's a really wonderful catharsis. Yeah, it was, it was very important to me that Marie be allowed to tell her story in her own way. Um, and I don't know if by the end, you know, you know what happens to Marie and I don't know if you call it justice, but it, it meant a lot that she at least had an ear like Michael's and I hope that she thought that was enough. Um, it, that was one of the big things that I wanted to address is 14 year old Caroline Fugate, I felt that she never got a chance to say anything of her own words, you know, uh, nobody believed her just out and out. So Marie spinning this wild tale, you can take it any number of ways. You can take it that she is 100% telling the truth. This is, a, this is an outlandish story, but stranger things have happened. And there's a lot of unanswered questions regarding the forensics of these bodies that her story may be the best explanation that you have. Um, you could see it as she's been traumatized and she has disassociated and she believes this and this is what she has to do. This is the story that she has to, has to believe in order to survive as a trauma victim or you can just say that she knew nobody was going to believe her anyway. And so why not, why not have it be a vampire? It's not going to make any bit of difference anyway. So I think, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to give any spoilers, but like, I think that the nature of the endings that both of us wrote um, were very true to the human experience that maybe not as neat and tidy as readers are accustomed to. And that's a risk. It is. You know, open endings are a risk. They are. Um, I love them. Do you enjoy them? I love an open ending. Oh, yeah. Oh, so much. Um, you know, but it, it, it's really funny. My, my cat has decided to attack a chair. <laughs> Let's see if we can, whoop, she's just now just running away, but it was, it was highly distracting. Okay. Um, I think that we should go to the Q&A because we've okay. got a number of questions in there. Um, do you want to just go down the list, Kendara? Sure, yeah. So um, let's see here. So anonymous attendee asks, do you know what really happened at the end of the book? And I'm assuming she's talking to me, but Martha, if you want to add anything about, yeah, um, of course, yes, I do. Um, but I did make a promise to myself when I started the book that I would never tell anybody, not even my husband. And he's really, really mad about that. Every like day, he's like, so, so it was this, right? And I'm like, I'm not saying. He's like, yeah, but it was that, right? <laughs> I'm not saying. You should so. put it in an envelope, though, that, you know, could be opened in the event of your exsanguination. <laughs> Yikes, I think I'm being put at risk for exsanguination by my husband. <laughs> or any of us, really. I mean, who would drink all your blood, you know? Okay. Yeah. Um, what upcoming releases are you excited about? We kind of talked about what I'm excited about, so. Um, oh, The Troubled Girls of the Dragomere Academy by Anne Ursu. It's a middle grade, um, and uh, it's about a girl in a village whose brother is destined to become a wizard and then things go awry. Um, it's really, really beautifully written. Um, I'm trying to think of other stuff. Oh, um, Anna Marie McElmore has a Gatsby retelling um, that's like gay and trans and it sounds exactly like a book that I want to read. Um, and I love her writing. On the nonfiction side, yeah, um, on the nonfiction side, Kekla Magoon has um, a book about the Black Panthers, Revolution in Our Time. And so it's, it's long listed on the National Book Award. Mm. Um, and it is an absolute feat of research. And it does for the Black Panthers, I think, what that Ron Chernow Hamilton book did for Hamilton. So before Chernow, Hamilton was reviled as a monarchist. The Black Panthers are very widely reviled as, um, you know, dangerous and scary. And in fact, the Black Panthers started school breakfast programs, feeding school children breakfast and lunch. That was the Black Panthers. 
And so imagine people whose story has been told by a white media. Yeah. Um, imagine that narrative centering the lives and experiences of the Black people who are at the heart of it. And so I think it's going to, um, you know, refocus a lot of um, distortions that have happened in history. So I'm pretty excited about it. Okay, next, let's see. If someone loves your books, who would you recommend next? Um, I would say it depends on what you love them for. If you love them for the humor, I go with Lish McBride because she and I have a very similar sense of humor and she is hilarious. Um, if you love them for the horror aspect, I think there are a number of, of YA authors right now who are doing great horror. Tiffany Jackson just came out with the fantastic White Smoke last week. I highly recommend that you pick that up. Um, and if you like dark fantasy, well, I mean, there's just so much dark fantasy to choose from. Um, hmm, let's see. Crown of Feathers by Nikki Pau Preto is an excellent duo trilogy, duology or trilogy about Phoenix Riders and Warring Queens. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it's, it's really good. Martha? Oh, people who love my books, who would I recommend? Um, I will have to, um, second curses by Lish McBride. We have dueling, um, book covers with, um, girls with claw marks across their face. So her book curses, um, came out this summer and it's really good. Um, I'm trying to think, um, oh, I just read, um, Pride and Premeditation by Tirza Price. Um, and it's a, it's a Jane Austen, um, imagine if Jane Austen, um, Jane Austen's Elizabeth Bennet really wanted to be a lawyer. Um, and, uh, she's got another one, um, in the series coming out. And so it's basically Jane Austen fan fiction. Um, so I think people who are drawn to my nerdiness would appreciate that as well. Excellent. Someone asked, are we getting any more from Fenburn? Uh, yes and no. Um, my next fantasy series, which I'm codenaming Amazon Jedi right now, because that's what it is. Like, what if the Amazons were Jedis? Um, it features a former Fenburn queen as a supporting character. I meant for her to just have a cameo, but in true war queen fashion, she busted through the door and demanded to have a bigger part in the story. <laughs> So tangentically, you will get a little bit more Fenburn lore just through her, but it's not a Fenburn book. It is an Amazon Jedi's book. Okay. Do you think you'll write more historically inspired novels with a spin? I have no idea. I never, I, are you the kind of writer, Martha, that has a million different ideas to choose from? Because I am not. I have to write what pops up. I think I have a good idea about once every two years. So I have no choice. I have to use that one because the rest are terrible. You know, I, I tend to have a lot of ideas, um, but I've learned that I have to be careful with them. And so for me, um, the best way to handle an idea that wants to be written is to think and write and not talk about it. Um, and, you know, until I kind of have enough momentum that the talking um, helps instead of squashes it. I, it's funny because I sent my editor, you know, here's three ideas that I could have that I would next write. And she picked one. And so then I wrote an outline for it. And now I don't want to write it. <laughs> oh, no. So, yeah, I don't want, I'll, 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 I'll get my enthusiasm back for it. Um, but another idea has come creeping around the corner. And so I'm going to quietly work on that one. Mm -hmm. So sure, your editor, I, had, I wanted to ask you though about the historical aspect. I'm sorry, everyone. I'm just butting in with another question. Um, 1958, that's when all these bodies are set. And did I make this up that Anna, the, in Anna dressed in blood, she died in 1958. Yeah. She died in 1958. 1958 was a very bad year. 
I mean, the reason that I set all these bodies in 1958 is because that is when the um, true crimes that it's inspired by occurred. Um, Caroline Fugate and Charlie Starkweather were 1957, 1958, and the Clutter family was murdered a year later in 1959. So it was perfect. So that is perfect, but it also like feels like a nod back to Anna. Yeah, I realized that like way later, I'm like, oh my goodness, I wonder if Marie and Anna know each other. Probably not, but. Probably, they probably hung out. <laughs> okay, let's see. I love how much your books focus on feminist issues and female relationships. Is that an intentional focus to make a statement or something that comes naturally in your writing? I think we both have answers for this one. Um, Martha? Um, it, absolutely. I mean, I, and I think that feminist issues are not just for girls and women. F um, feminist issues are for everybody um, because until the world, ex you know, accepts everybody equally, men, women, non-binary people, trans people, until we're all equal, um, then, you know, we're squandering the talents of people who are suppressed. And so I think it's incredibly important to tell stories um, that show what the oppression looks like and the damage that it causes, um, and also to show the power that women have. And it's not all physical violence. That was one of the things in Into the Blood Red Woods. You know, the person who saves the day does not do it by drawing blood. Um, and that was on purpose because I think that, again, violence is basically a tool of the patriarchy. Um, so anyway. I like that you. she jumped up like she agreed. Like she, she, she was just like, yes. She totally did. This is, this is my cat who sits by me. Oh, close to the writing day. She's very sweet. She is so cute. I see her on Instagram sometimes and she's very pretty. Um, yes, it's, it's also, I mean, it's both for me. It's, uh, it's, uh, it comes naturally because I think, especially lately, I am just far more interested in powerful female characters than I am in powerful male characters. Not to say that I don't have any powerful male characters in my books and that I don't love them, but... Um, I, writing Fenber in particular, was an absolute delight because I got to put females in roles of power and nobody questioned it. Nobody asked them why they were there. Nobody second guessed their decisions. Nobody checked their credentials because it was a matriarchy. And that's just the way things were. And that was so refreshing to me. It was like, oh, wouldn't that be something? <laughs> yes, yes, it would. Although my, one of my kids and I have had the, the, debate, you know, if it was a matriarchy, would it be just as bad, but in reverse? And I don't know. I do know that with bonobos versus chimpanzees, they're very, very similar. Um, just tiny um, differences in their genetic code. Chimpanzees are male-dominated. Bonobos are female-dominated. Bonobos um, engage in lots of cuddling and kissing and kind of sexual behavior to keep the peace. Chimpanzees are incredibly violent, and there's even some chimpanzees that have made spears. And so I don't know, but that is an example of a very closely related primate to us that is a matriarchy that is not violent. Yeah, we may have less violence. I think in a matriarchy, we'd have perhaps less outright violence, but I mean, women can still kill, and uh, we're still humans. So just because it's a matriarchy, it's not going to be a utopia because just by the fact that we're all humans, we all kind of suck on a certain level and we're going to make a lot of mistakes. So Yeah, the question, like, what do people who have power do? And, you know, there's that, does absolute power corrupt? I don't know. I've never had it, but I'm willing <laughs> to try. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, give us a shot. <laughs> What's the worst that could happen? Try? Yeah. Free books for everyone. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, um, inspiration for another book, or are we in the middle of a draft and of an idea for another book? And I think this might have to be the last question because it looks like we're oh, yeah. out of time. So uh, Martha, could you tell us what you're working on next? Um, I'm working on a nonfiction book about artificial intelligence. Oh, I love it. I love AIs. 
It's, They're so it, creepy and wonderful. It's super interesting. Um, what's next for you? I, mean, I, know, I know the Buffy book's coming and I'm very excited about that. Yes. That is what I am working on right now. I mean, my next book, my next book will be Amazon Jedi's in 2023, uh, kicks off a new fantasy series. But right now, the first Buffy book, which is a new, um, a new Slayer in New Sunnydale for a new generation, it's called In Every Generation, and that releases on January 4th. And I'm currently writing the second book of that. Awesome. Is it time to... The it's wheel. the time. Let's spin the wheel and give away some books. Hi, yeah, Ellen. let's spin the wheel. Okay. <laughs> all right. So I have all of the names on the wheel. Um, audience members, I am so sorry, but we are going to limit this. Uh, we are going to limit this giveaway to people inside the United States. So sorry, international folks. Winner, if you could just let us know once you've found out whether you won that you are in the States just to make sure that everything is running smoothly. And now I'm gonna go ahead and screen share our wheel and let's spin this thing, shall we? All right. Well, look at this, that. I hope this works. Oh my God, it's the All These Bodies wheel. <laughs> <gasps> All right. So congratulations, Jamie. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this share. Jamie, just let us know that you're in the States. So that would, we would greatly appreciate that. Um, and I think that we are about to close out our time together. So... At this point, I'm just going to take these last few minutes to say a huge, huge thank you to both of our authors for being here. This was such a wonderful conversation. Audience members, thank you so much for tuning out. We are so happy to have you here. For everyone who'd like to get your hands on copies of all these bodies or pre-order Into the Blood Red Woods, um, go ahead and follow the links. I'm going to repost them so you don't have to go scrolling and searching. I know I flooded you with lots of book links, but I got so I get excited when we're talking about books. I can't help myself. So giveaway winner, we will get in touch with you very soon. And um, of course, everyone, let us know what you thought of this event, either in person if you're local or on any social media. We always, always love to hear from you. Uh, Kendara and Martha, huge, huge thank you for this conversation. This was so much fun. And I think that this is where we say good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. Thanks, oh, wonderful. Thank you, Jamie. Bye. Good night. <laughs>